Okay, welcome everybody to Data Visualization Workgroup sponsored by PNAMP, the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership. We're based out of Cook, Washington, and now we're having two presentations today, one from Steve Rubin and one from Sachin Shah, and their presentations will be sort of a tag team. So I'm coming to you now from Tacoma, Washington, where I'm at the ESIP conference, which is the Earth Science Information Partners. And this is a resource that would be useful for all of you. I will be putting information about the meeting that they're having, a summer meeting right now, uh, which will be recorded and available August 8th. I'll put that in our resources document. Sachin can take the screen. So Steve Rubin, a uh, fishery biologist based in Seattle and with USGS and now at the Western Fisheries Center, but with USGS since 1994, uh, is presenting about Chinook and their habitat, well, young Chinook and their habitat in eelgrass in Puget Sound, and Sachin Shah with USGS since 1999 with Georgia and the Texas Water Science Centers, and has spent six years in Asia with the World Bank Water Program in South Asia, and is now also in Seattle as the international team lead. Sachin, if you can take the screen and take it away. I'll give it over to, to Steve to just start us off. Okay, so just an overview of this. I'm going to try and give uh, just enough background on the data so that when Sachin takes over describing the data visualization tool that he developed, that you guys can follow along. Okay, so here we go on the data background. Uh, several of us have been working on characterizing juvenile salmon and forage fish use of eelgrass, particularly on large river deltas in Puget Sound. And so just quick on eelgrass, it's a flowering plant that occurs in in the near shore, in the deep intertidal and shallow subtidal areas. And on large river deltas it forms extensive meadows like you can see on, on in this in this picture. And uh, this here's an underwater shot. Um, it creates three dimensional habitat. Um, and uh, you might be able to see the, the fish in this picture. Uh, let's see, do I have a, a pointer? Yes, I do. Can you guys see the pointer? Yes, can't we can. Me. You can see the pointer? Okay, well anyway, there's the fish, just for fun. Okay, um, so the issues with the um, use of eelgrass, uh, just, you know, there's there's um, details here. What's, the, what's a port? Does does the does the eelgrass provide for juvenile salmon as they're out migrating through the estuary, if any? And then there's local um, forest fish species that also use the habitats. So uh, you know when is it important? What settings is it important in? So forth and so on. Um, and the second issue is you know the the, uh, the river deltas have been gone through. Many of them have been modified a lot and this will become clearer in the next couple of slides but especially with diking and river channelization to create um, to protect farmland from saltwater intrusion so um, the work I'm I'm gonna we're gonna talk about is uh, conducted in the Skagit River Delta uh, and so this is a picture of it and here uh, top of the screen is the river coming in. It splits into the North Fork and the South Fork. Um, and you can see all this farmland that is protected by dikes. And these in the North Fork and South Fork, but particularly the North Fork, are, are, are channelized. There's riprap on both sides of the bank. So, um, and what that, just leave it at that. But then in this picture, where the eelgrass is, so this this whole area here is uh, the uh, tide flats. I mean, it's a it's, Skagit River is a is a big river, and this is a big area when you're out there on the boat. Um, and the eelgrass grows on the outer edge of this of this flat area. You can kind of see this dark area also up here. That's eelgrass. Okay. This is the same picture, but schematic to show our sampling design. Um, so what's important for this presentation are these zones. 
four zones, two, three, four. Um, and they and they differ um, in in the um, in their characteristics. And one one thing that's important is there's a there's a this is this is a navigation channel that that is um, kept is dredged to allow boats to go up here and eventually can get up to Padilla Bay that way. It's kind of like a mini Panama Canal or something, although it doesn't have any locks on it. And uh, so there's a jetty that separates the North Fork coming down here from the navigation channel, uh, which makes this up here different from the rest. It's a depositional zone for fine sediment. It's a little bit more saline because it doesn't get as, quite as much fresh water from the, from the river. Uh, leave it at that. And then uh, zone two is off the North Fork. Zone three is in the middle. Zone four is off the South Fork. Zones outlined in green or brown. Um, those are our those are our sampling sites. And the ones outlined in green are eelgrass inside are eelgrass, and the ones and the ones in brown are um, unvegetated, basically unvegetated tide flats. And we had site we tried to and so the, this design was to do paired um, pair sampling eelgrass and unvegetated in each zone, except in zone one, there was no comparable. We, there was, we couldn't do unvegetated because there just wasn't anything that was comparable. Uh, and the other slight detail on this is that um, these unvegetated sites were added. This is a three-year study. The unvegetated sites were added in the second year. So there's no, there's only the vegetated, there's only the eelgrass areas in uh, the first year. Okay. Uh, see anything else on that? I don't think so. Okay, so this is when we sampled monthly, April through September, and there's the three years, 2008 through 2010. Um, <clears throat> and this is this is salmon time. This is the uh, this is when the uh, out migrating out migrating juvenile salmon are in our study area. That's so they were obviously the highest priority species for us. Uh, okay, and this is how how we how we sampled. Um, it's uh, this technique called the pair netting, and uh, basically it's like an offshore beach stain, and we deploy it with two boats and and retrieve it. Um, just think offshore beach sand is good enough for now. And these are the species that, the Chinooks, Chinook were the species of salmon most common in our catches, which is not surprising. They're the ones that use the estuary the most. And we also caught um, these, the, the um, lots of herring and surf smelt. Those are two important forest species. And also lots of shiner perch, which people care less about, but we included them in our studies. Okay, so that was the spatial and temporal background on the data, and so I set this up, and so we set we we set up these null hypotheses. You might hear about them again from Dachin, but uh, they basically go with um, with I'll just the uh, so no difference in abundance between eelgrass and unvegetated. So that's only zones two through four, and only 2009 and 2010. Then there's a, and that takes care of the that one question: Is there some are, are fish keying in on the eelgrass as opposed to the surrounding habitat? Uh, then the second one is no difference in abundance abundance in eelgrass among the zones. So we're leaving out the unvegetated habitat on that one. Um, and this gets at the differences I started to describe between between the zones and whether they're off the North Fork or the South Fork, different possibly differences in characteristics, that kind of thing. Uh, and that's all three years, but no unvegetated. Uh, third one is just, we. Oh, I forgot to mention, we, we collect temperature, salinity, and depth at each one of our sites every time we set the net. And so this is whether the, the abundance was related to that somehow. And four and five are the same as one and two body size of fish. I think that's all I have. So now I'll turn it over to Sutch. Okay. So 
I'm going to start with the, the visualizations themselves. But how this all happened was that I was lucky enough to go out in the field with Steve, and there was a lot of manual labor that I was not prepared for. But there was also a lot of fascinating data that came out of it. And while I was out there on the field, we were collecting this information. And the way my mind works, it was more along the lines of, okay, what kind of data is being collected? Are we quantifying something? And can we distill this information in a way that others can consume rather than just you know, tables and text? And finally, you know, how well does the science bridge the decision making? So can we create a narrative that follows all four of those criteria? And the answer was yes. So as we look through this, we in fact did try to condense what was happening out there into a narrative before we you know, actually got to the data visuals themselves. And then uh, we took, um, and by the way, just to, just to let you guys know that we had on our team, on our geospatial science and cyber innovation team, a geographer who, who actually took the data and, and created these data visuals with the help of, of Steve kind of going through and saying if data visuals make sense along with the science. And that, and that was key here, right? So you know, creating a narrative without the scientists is, is quite difficult and what the, what the questions are. So what we did based on Steve and the other scientists' hypotheses is we took each hypothesis and created a visual with them. And the purposes of this presentation, I, I won't actually do the, the interactions with the visuals here, so I'll, I'll get out of that and um, kind of take them to, a, to where we actually did our visualizations, which was in Tableau. So this is on the Tableau server. And, and as I mentioned, we took each null hypothesis so here, these first two hypotheses, where there's no difference in abundance between eelgrass and unvegetated habitats, right? But specifically in hypothesis one, we're looking at uh, 2009, 2010, and in predefined zones two and four. And those predefined zones were, up, were, were defined by the scientists themselves. And then in hypothesis two, uh, the hypothesis is that there's no difference in abundance in eelgrass among all of the zones. Well, that would be zones one through four, and then those would be years 2008 to 2010. So in our, in our narrative on our website, um, you know, that goes into to things further. But what we wanted to show is, first of all, again, we are quantifying something. And in this particular case, we're quantifying, um, in general, the abundance of, of these fish across spatio-temporal lines. And the way, you know, I, I like to think of these things is actually adding data to these visuals rather than taking away. And what I mean by that is that we're looking at um, eelgrass in unvegetated habitats. Specifically for uh, hypothesis one, we're looking at zones two through four here. And yellow represents eelgrass and how many catches were made uh, from 2009 to 2010. Red represents an unvegetated uh, habitat. So for that particular sort of null hypothesis, that's what we were looking at. Um, and as you read the narrative, you know, the text, textual narrative along with the graphical narrative, that's, that's hopefully what folks can see um, just by looking at it in you know, offhand, right? Um, and so if we, again, add data, so this is hypothesis two, where there's no difference in abundance in eelgrass among zones, we can actually add all zones together, so that's zone one, and the server's running a little slow, it seems, yep. And this is for all three years. Um, you can see there's a little bit more data added, but um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to look at is there is no difference in abundance eelgrass among all of the zones, right? So again, the eelgrass is in the yellow, so there's plenty of it. And as you scroll, you can look at the different types of, uh, of, of catches, I should say, in each of these circles. So the larger the circle, the larger the amount of catches. The smaller the circle, uh, not as many catches as as the others, right? 
So that's that's what we're getting at there. Now uh, I'll go back to the actual web page itself. It actually gives you the, the null hypotheses and it tells you what these visuals, what the functionality of those visuals are. Um, so as it as it goes along with the journal article that that was written. Now that was hypothesis one and two. Um, hypothesis three is is kind of fascinating because what we're looking at is again the quantity, the abundance of each species and how it's not related to what I'll just call water quality sort of parameters, the temperature, the salinity, and the water column depth in general. So if I were to, as, as we visualized this, we said to ourselves, okay, there's three years of data, and um, we've broken those up into months, right? And Steve specifically asked for those months just to look at seasonality kind of changes, and, and that makes sense. So we were looking into these seasonal, you know, periods and are in fact water temperature, salinity, and column depth, do they even show a pattern um, across those zones? And the answer is absolutely not. So as uh, firsthand, you can you can actually see it. Um, but again, the way I, I look at these things is, you know, there's four species of fish. Uh, and if we're just looking at Chinook, salmon, um, and the various parameters there. Again, there's there's no pattern here. But what I do want to show you is, is in fact that these aren't just a bunch of bars and lines. You can actually look to see what these actually represent. So salmon, number of catches there, and then side by side, what in the fact, what is the water column depth, the temperature and salinity um, at the top or at the bottom? And is there, in fact, a pattern across seasonality as well as across species? So if we add more data, you can compare species. That was Pacific herring. This is shiner perch. And this is surf smell. So you can spend quite a bit of time here uh, you know, comparing species across zones and in relation to uh, the water quality. Um, so again, right off the bat, you can just tell visually that the patterns don't necessarily exist. And then you can take a deeper dive into what those particular data are, what they mean, and even if you dive deeper, why there's no pattern. And that's where the complementary, you know, citations of a journal come in. So just to be clear, you know, these visuals aren't necessarily uh, replacing a citable journal article or report, but it's very complementary in the sense that you can actually look at the data in a different way than just textual content. So that's that's how we we viewed this. So what's what's interesting here is as you go on into these next two hypotheses, the uh, hypothesis four and five, what we're focusing on is again a quantity, and in this particular case. The quantity is body size or the body length. So for hypothesis four, what we wanted to see was the body size of fish does not differ in the various types of vegetation. Our vegetation, again, being eelgrass versus an unvegetated habitat. So if that, if that in fact is the hypothesis, what we wanted to do in this visual is to show the the in focus on length, right? So when we as the end user think about um, uh, the length of something, we're thinking in horizontal terms. If we're thinking about elevation or height, we think of data in vertical terms. And that's kind of the approach we took with this. The second thing here are the colors, the yellow and the red. And we wanted to be consistent with hypothesis one and two when we were showing spatial temporal uh, uh, abundances of fish in the various zones. So if you remember, we had you know, yellow on those maps as eelgrass and red as unvegetated habitats. And that's sort of the approach we took here. Now, again, this is really fascinating because the hypothesis itself is that no difference in body size exists between eelgrass and unvegetated. Right? This is where adding and comparing species is really fun to look at. So on the left hand side, we have our species. I only have yeah. all four of the species. 
I have all four of the species listed, listed up there and in each of the years that they were collected. So if you just wanted to look at Chinook, yeah, the server's a little slow. If you just wanted to look at Chinook, um, and Chinook was collected in three years uh, in the eelgrass and two years in an unvegetated habitat state, um, you can you can see that, and here's the average, the mean fork length, that, yeah, there is, in, there is, in fact, no difference, or very little difference, in fact, in body size between eelgrass and unvegetated state. Um, and you can, you can you know, kind of query this out, if you will, based on months. You can just look at various years. But what's fascinating about this is if you're actually comparing every species. And the same holds true on, an, on, a, on a mean fork length anyways, um, that in fact there is no difference. And uh, that's where you know, a quantity of something compared to um, a particular parameter, in this particular case, the vegetation, really makes sense and really pops out. Right. So, and the, and the last hypothesis here is the fifth one. And uh, what we're talking about here is body size, length of, of each species in eelgrass does not, in fact, differ among the four zones, these predefined zones that the scientists had defined. So, Again, since we're talking about length, we're talking about how our eye catches things in horizontal ways, right? If this, if this was a vertical bar chart, um, you know, the, the kind of content and the narrative might get a little muddy. But since we're thinking about things in length, we have horizontal here. And I basically sequestered Chinook right off the bat um, just, to, just to show one particular species. And again, this is average. Um, in all four zones in all three years. And I have all four zones checked there. But again, if we were to keep adding on data, meaning adding on species, you'd have the herring, the perch, and the smelt um, all there right on top of one another. And uh, it, it's quite fascinating to see that you know, all four zones, at least in the mean fork length, um, does in fact hold true. And this is what we want to show, right? And in a perfect world, we would be able to collect this information. I'm just showing here zone one for those, uh, for those, for those lengths in yield graph. But in a perfect world, what we in fact want to do is as we're collecting data out in the field, we would start adding that information onto what we already have. So now this is only 2008 to 2010. But as we're collecting data out in the field, it is just data, and we can put this into the back-end database and just start showing things, you know, in, in what we'll define here as real-time. We can show our partners, our funders, our, you know, fellow researchers how things are changing over time. And, and that's really the goal of this particular data visualization. There's so many out there. But for this particular tool, that's, that's really where the, the, the crux of its sort of functionality and success really is. So in terms of those null hypotheses, that's what we do. Now, that's what we did. But what was also important in this particular web presence um, is that we distilled down what the results were for Chinook salmon, for example, or other forage fish. And it's important, like I said, to have this be complementary to the journal article. So folks can go ahead and get the journal article right off the bat or they can get the raw data. And this raw data is from the USGS um, Science Base uh, data portal. So it's our open data sort of repository for many of our projects or for our projects in general. And uh, you can get both the journal article itself that Steve and others wrote, as well as the raw data. So hopefully in that raw data, you can replicate perhaps some of these visuals or some of the uh, sort of analysis and, and hypotheses results that, that Steve and others got as well. So uh, I hope that wasn't too quick, but I just wanted to go over the, the why and the how and uh, hopefully the narrative that these visuals show. So Sharon, I, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted me to, to bring up regarding that. Um, that was great.
the why, the how, what, you, what we're seeing is great. And you mentioned um, the back end is Tableau. Is it all Tableau, or are you using a combination of platforms? No. So in this particular case, visuals, it's all Tableau. And so Jennifer did this about, I would say, 10, 11 months ago. And since then, since you know, 11, 12 months ago, Tableau has updated uh, itself dramatically. Um, there's more functionality. There's more you know, ability to sort of step out of you know the the finance zone. And what I mean by that is that's what Tableau was created for was quantification of numbers in the financial industry. So as scientists, mm -hmm. taking that particular theory at hand and sort of creating that for something like this is uh, is something that you know I think worked to success for us for this particular project. So no, to answer your question, it's it's fully Tableau in this particular case. Hey, Sashim, That's great. Uh, there is a question on the chat. Um, can you talk about the dual access scale? Uh, the talk about the dual access scale uh, in what context, sorry? Um, I'm not positive. What context? Okay. But, I'll just take this one. Um, so on the left there, the number of catches by species, this is hypothesis three, by the way, where we're talking about abundance is not related to temperature, salinity, or depth. Um, so on the left-hand side, there's the number of catches by species. On the right-hand side, just have a, uh, an access for, for temperature, salinity, and average depth, sort of giving folks a, an idea of, of the pattern or lack thereof. Um, not sure where. There's anything beyond that. Yeah, um, they said yes. Sometimes it's hard to do, uh, but it seems to work out here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of that, to be perfectly honest, so I, and I can I can ask Jennifer after this. It, a lot of that is pure luck. In the sense, not in the sense of the, the the ability to do it, but the numbers themselves. It worked out here. Right. Does anyone else have questions before we move on to other presentations? Um, if you're muted, you can unmute yourself. You might have to unmute yourself um, both in Zoom and on your phone. Looks like we're good, Sachin. Anybody can jump in on the chat as well if you'd rather <coughs> um, chat and ask a question that way. So, Sachin, you were show you were planning to show us a couple other visualizations that you'd worked on, and yeah. So let me this. What I was going to do is can you all see that? This is the presentation for uh, the path forward for web-based visualizations. Looks good. Yes, we can see it. You can see it, perfect. Okay, so what I was gonna do here is just show four or five slides about uh, the branch itself, what, you know, how what our mission is, what, how we go about doing things, and then I'll go into a couple of visualizations, if that works. Um, so yeah, so, you know, you know, I introduced myself before, or Sharon did, but what I want to just do here in the second half, I just you know give a, a brief discussion about the branch's mission, why we do what we do, how we go about doing it, and the mere fact that, and what's important, is how we bridge that science to decision making. Um, and a lot of the visuals that we've done, a lot of the web applications that we have done, spawn from the fact that there was actually nothing out there, and um, people needed the information rather quickly, um, especially real-time information. So, um, what I'll what I'll show you here is the, this is our homepage: geospatial cyber, geospatial science, cyber innovation branch. We have you know, applications there for you to see our our homepage. There is webapps.usgs.gov, but in general, and I was talking about this earlier, 
you know, our goal here is to intersect the science and technology with interdisciplinary expertise. So what I mean by that, and this map shows that we're pretty much all over. Um, I sit in Seattle. We have an individual in Portland, Nebraska, Florida, and the most of my team is in Austin, Texas. But what I mean by interdisciplinary expertise is that, you know, philosophy-wise, I feel like, you know, technology uh, it spreads across the entire spectrum, meaning having scientists, biologists, physical scientists, geographers, the computer scientists, and developers all in one shop. We have a basic pipeline of understanding um, and bringing in how science really does relate to the data visualization. Does the visualization make sense from a scientific standpoint? And then does that science actually bridge you know, the gap between a decision that needs to be made now, quite quickly, or if it's an overarching programmatic type of scientific sort of problem that we're trying to solve, can we make decisions along the way? Not necessarily in real time, but along the way. And that's our that's our goal here. So you now we can do, you know, in many of our visualizations and applications, geospatial and data analysis, remote sensing, modeling, statistics, and our computer scientists are you know heavy into code software development, and then uh, our developers are the ones back in, front end, are doing the design uh, aspect of things. So for those of you that are, you know, may or may not be on the, in, in the survey, but maybe outside, I sit in the water mission area in the Texas Water Science Center, though, and we work many, you know, water type projects, but we have actually do quite a bit of things across missions, right? So ecosystems, the Western fisheries in this particular case, um, environmental health, natural hazards, and uh, energy resources. So across, we've done lots of work, collaborative work with scientists, as well as our sort of shop across the board. And what's nice about that is what that tells us is that the, the, the science, no matter what mission area, that narrative has to be told in different ways, right? And um, it, it's just a different type of nuanced type of information that needs to be told in a particular narrative. So that's the sort of that's the sort of uh, you know, theory and mission and, and what kind of gets us excited uh, to do these things. So um, you know, talking about the visualization, you know, we're also talking about how we use it the information, how we use the data, how we wrangle that data that ultimately turns out to be something that's aesthetically pleasing and hopefully something the end user can consume, right? And, you know, we have direct measurements, the primary measurements and secondary data compilation stuff that the survey does and it does, you know, phenomenally. And we're adding on various types of analyses into the visualizations. And the reason to do that, right, is that and I'll, I'll just say that, you know, the, the fishery side of things is we have just a bunch of data, fish health, ecology, maybe water quality, and trying to distill that down and fill in those data gaps. And where those data gaps are being filled in now are especially with remote sensing and modeling. And to hopefully kind of distill that, wrangle that down to make data derived decisions. And so if we can make our visualizations and applications do just that, then, then we've hopefully a short or long term problem in terms of the decisions themselves. And so, you know, we have to make these scalable. So, for example, uh, Steve's work here, as we add on more and more data and get a more robust data set, we can make perhaps better decisions on them. And then we have to make them relational, meaning relational. So it's not just water data from the water mission area, for example that's important, but coupling that with ecosystems data, or coupling that with you know, data on risk. Um, and then open source. We want people to be able to, to not only use them, but hopefully replicate this. You know, hopefully people can take this information and make it even better, you know, and that's, that's the goal. So uh, what I'll do here is you know, maybe go over a couple of applications here. One is uh, the Walker Basin Reservoir. Um, and real-time reservoir information, stream gauging information, and weather, and so forth. And a lot of that, this is extremely important because there are so many partners involved. 
And this is a good example of having many people at the table, you know, having an idea of what exactly is going on over such a large scale. That's one. And the second one, I wanted to talk about, this is real-time stream and water quality um, in a drinking water reservoir for the fourth largest city, this being Houston, and how they are using this to actually uh, make decisions on water treatment. And the last one, and I, I included this uh, just from the standpoint that it is about aquatic biota and fish. And this is a, a Delaware River in Texas. And if we, and if we, now half time, I can show this to you. But the other two are are really important in terms of decision making, the types of data that are being used to make those decisions, and you know the sheer amount of uh, of stakeholders that are using this information on a daily basis. So let me get out of that and actually show you some of these. All right, I'll start with Walker Basin here. And Walker Basin is fascinating, like I said, because of, uh, of how many people are actually using this information, how much data wrangling had to take place. There's about 10 partners um, with 10 different interests. and um, many, many constituents regarding those interests. And so um, it's an interactive map. And what, what, what this Walker Basin Hydro Mapper, as we call it, does is it provides like a, a basin-wide perspective of real-time stream flow, stage of those rivers, as well as lake and reservoir storage capacity. Right? And a lot of this has to do with available snow melt, you know, drought conditions. Um, and it was really developed to create a common operating picture of water users in, in the basin and help monitor changes in stream flow, in stream flows rather, and associated with the basin itself. So this basin goes from Colorado into Nevada and um, we're just showing interactively what is, is, is going on, you know, what the conditions are exactly. So right off the bat, what we're looking at here is a real-time reservoir storage. Um, across the basin. And what folks are using this for, and it's mostly, just to point out here, it's, it's the BLM or BOR, Bureau of Reclamation, USDA, the conservancies that are out there, as well as many others, private and public, who are trying to understand you know, what water usage is gonna look like both currently and in the future for agriculture, for you know, general domestic use or industrial use, what have you. And these are real-time conditions um, in these various lakes in the basin. So, and we can look at this, what real-time storage actually looks like. And, you know, over time, this is current conditions up here, 54,000 acre feet. But if we look back in time, you can see there was something going on back in early July, right? Why was it so low, right? These are the kinds of things that, you know, we need to look at, we being both the scientist, we being both the decision maker, what is actually going on? Why was the, the storage so low there? And this is you know, pretty indicative of this particular lake near Topaz, California. It's very much uh, you know, inconsistent like that quite often. And so this is the stage uh, of, the, of the lake itself. So you have storage, you have stage of the lake, but coupled with the actual reservoir itself, we also have stream flow in the rivers that are downstream and upstream of these lakes, right? So we're looking at you know, what happened at this river. It was, did the, the lake actually, or did the reservoir actually release water? Is that why it's so high? Or, or what? You know, how much rain did they receive? How much snow melt did they receive? And what's quite nice is you can actually look at this throughout the entire basin. Now, just to give you a, a description of what these colors mean exactly. Um, green here, you see all these stream flow measurements. Uh, this is, means it's, it's normal for this time of year, right? Um, and, which is great, but these lighter blue areas, meaning it's in the 76th and 90th, 90th percentile, means it's pretty much above normal for this time of year, which is an interesting phenomenon for them that usually is not the case. Um, so 
So this is just a different type of, of kind of situation. Now, you know, we were able to get with the NRCS and get snow telemetry data, the snow tell data as well. So the narrative now improves and you can tell a different story about what is or is not happening and what we might have to do in the future if you were a decision maker in this area. So you know, we're able to, to get external partners data. So what's important about this is not just USGS data, we're able to bring in other data as well. Right? And, and that was key because many times USGS visuals, applications, what have you, things that we serve are typically USGS data collection only. And, um, you know, as we move forward, we're, just, we're going to have to start bringing in other partners' data as well. And it's, and it's going to be important for the future of, of decision making in general. So we have snow telemetry data. Now, what's important here as well is understanding, particularly in this case, you know, what does the rain situation look like? I've turned on the radar information from National Weather Service and no rain. No rain any time uh, that's happened any time in the current, uh, you know, in the past hour. We can look at the past day, past three days. We can look at trends, what happened in terms of stream flow and reservoir storage um, when it does or does not rain. And it's a fascinating thing to see. So this particular data set is from the National Weather Service. Uh, we have snow melt, we have cloud cover, we have drought. All of these things um, were typically looked at separately, right? And as we know, these are not conditions or data sets that are mutually exclusive. And so having all of these things together in one, in one spot is absolutely key. Um, and putting you know, various other types of data on, here are the watersheds, that you can look at as an, on an individual basis, um, and just many other functionality. I won't show everything now, but many other functionality that we think are important. You know, there's also real-time water quality sites um, that we did not have in version one, for example, that we're now on version two for this. And you can look at real-time water quality. In this particular case, we're looking at temperature and conductance going on right now. So in the, if we want to look at a two-day period, we can zoom in and look at a two-day period for water quality uh, on the Walker River near at, at Walker Lake, you know, on the Walker River near mouth at Walker Lake, so basically the mouth of the river. And, um, you know, you can look at the temperature, conductance, how does that relate to stream flow? How does that relate to stage? How is that going to relate to storage, if at all? And um, and as I mentioned, you know, having these real-time water quality aspects to this is something that wasn't there before because we were solely, these partners were solely in, interested in quantity, not necessarily quality. And something else that we can look at here is we only have three sites here. You know, maybe we need to add more. Maybe those are the questions that we need to, to be considered. So this is just... Uh, Something I wanted to point out and show that you know, real time, number one, uh, it is extremely important, but data consistency, number two, and data abundance, number three, all three of those things are extremely important in telling the most robust narrative that you can. And what's, what's been really special here is, I, as I mentioned, the sheer number of partners that were involved in this was, was really the success story. So, so that was one. Now two, I mentioned I want to look at this. This is the water quality monitoring on Lake Houston. Now the reason this is a special case is one, is that the partner here is the city of Houston's water treatment plant. As you can imagine, the city of Houston being the fourth largest city has just gone through a horrific hurricane in, Hur in Hur Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey, what that did is that inundated the water treatment plants uh, on Lake Houston. And what they did not have was the way to prepare for losing the water quality data that we in fact have on the rivers that went into the lake and the water quality platforms that we, you can see here that are on the lake itself. 
and we're collecting real-time water quality data so that they can prepare water treatment operations. And now what they do have is in this particular interactive map that I'll show across large screens in their treatment facilities so that they can prepare you know, what's coming down the pipeline. You know, whether it rains or whether it's in a drought, what are they going to do? Um, and during Hurricane Harvey, those particular treatment plants were absolutely inundated and there was just a, a, a lack of information for, for them in real time to consider what to do. Um, and so we have here a narrative of, of you know, what the important aspects of water treatment are using our information. So turbidity is a big one for, for the water treatment processes. So just showing here what typical turbidity looks like, what turbidity afterwards look like. And just to, just to be clear, on these right-hand side of these, of these graphs here, that is all post-Hurricane Harvey. So it has completely inundated the, the neighborhoods that were there. And, and that, this is a good example of for folks to see what kind of damage all of the sediment coming down those rivers into the lake really has on, on a particular system, on a river system, on a lake system, the ecology, what have you. So what we decided to do is to provide them an understanding of what that looks like. Now, this is the San Jacinto River Basin. The drinking water reservoir is Lake Houston. So we zoom in on there. These upside down triangles are our real time water quality platforms on the lake. This is what they use along with uh, various other water quality type of parameters, stream flow as well, uh, down the rivers that actually feed into the lake. And all of this real-time information used to be on the national, or it still is, but what they used to do is refresh a web page every three minutes and hopefully see data that's refreshed on a table. And that is how they used to make their decisions. Now, what they can do is look at real-time plots of a particular platform all at the same time. So this particular platform I've chosen is this one. This is what we call, you know, it, this intercepts, as we call it, the, the sediment and the turbidity and, and the conductivity. This one down here is right at the treatment plant. So what they're able to do is sort of do an analysis of you know, how bad or good the turbidity, the temperature, the conductance, the dissolved oxygen, the pH, is in those various places. And they can, in real time and much earlier, actually prepare their treatment processes. And uh, so again, this is, this is happening right now, but if they wanted to look at analysis of what's happened in the last three days or so, they can do that. And all four of these real-time platforms do just that. Now, we do know just from our analysis that in this watershed, the western portion of the watershed, of the watershed is extremely urban. The eastern side, for example, is extremely rural. And, and we can look at different types of basic maps that can help us with that, you know, topography, streets, imagery, terrain, um, and, and look at how these different changes in the watershed and the development in these watershed impact stream flow, and water quality. That's the key. That's the key for the city of Houston, not just from a treatment standpoint, but from a planning standpoint, urban planning standpoint. And now, this being Houston, we actually might see some rain. Um, not now, then in the past. But you know, the past three days, have there been any rain? And th there you see. There you see the cumulative rainfall in the past three days. And this is from the National Weather Service. So it's a, it's a, it's a good way to do long-term trend analysis, what's actually going on at the moment. And then there's you know, weather forecast for the next two days, for example. And this is what they're forecasting um, in the Lake Houston region. So now, because of Hurricane Harvey, because of more frequent, more intense rainfalls, they're having to completely shift what they're 
procedures are going to be. They need now they need a, a, a more robust climate plan, a climate change plan on how they're going to handle uh, water quality sort of issues beforehand. So uh, th this has been extremely helpful for them. And just, just one more piece here, if there were any kind of you know, tornado warnings, hurricane warnings, storm warning advisories, those pop up automatically for them. And uh, what we've done for them internally also is, you know, have, you know, have a sort of email mechanism to, to where if a water quality parameter is at its, what, what they call a threshold point for treatment, it shoots them an email right away and says, you know, turbidity is at a certain point, stream flow is at a certain point, uh, this is important for you to look at. Um, so, again, as you can see right here that this river upstream of the lake is has gotten quite high. Um, now, you can also see that, you know, it rained a couple of days ago. Rivers in, in the Houston area run very slowly, and so that might be the reason. Or an upstream reservoir released water. So these whole riverine processes, how urbanization has impacted them, and how water quality changes as a result is extremely important for, for a system like this. And ecology, you know, an ecological type of studies are, are being asked to, are, are asked to be done here pretty soon. Um, what that actually in, entails is more along the lines of vegetation, and probably some, some uh, types of various fish and mussels and what have you. But those are the types of things being asked to do Adding that on here just makes the narrative more robust. And, and that's what I wanted to just show you here. So that's, that's a couple of the big ones, for sure. We are now in the process, uh, both FEMA and, and other sort of flood type of disaster agencies and organizations have asked us now to do real-time flood inundation mapping um, and to, to do some predictive analysis in this particular region. Um, now, it's been devastated for the past three, four years now, Houston has, in spite of this now being the third largest city here in a few years. So it's, it's going to be, you know, quite a, you know, quite a story to tell here pretty soon. Um, and the last one I want to show, and I want to show this for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is because it does have to do with aquatic biota, but two, I want to show you this because this is one of the first things we had done this is about four or five years ago. And I want to show you how far things have come along uh, from four or five years ago and how narratives change and how you can tell one a lot better. Uh, this has to do with the study with the university, uh, the Texas State University in, in West Texas. And it has to do with aquatic biota and habitats of the Delaware River uh, in the Texas version, I guess, of the Delaware River. And we were looking at documenting various species in the Delaware in a particular county. Um, and, and the university has had primary objectives to do that. They just wanted to compile historic records, look at spatial trends, you know, look at quantity and quality of water and whatnot. But just to show you rather quickly um, how far you know, we've come along since this. This was done about four or five years ago. And what we're looking at is are things like geomorphic units, substrates, vegetation coverage, water quality, fish relative abundance, et cetera. Um, and if you wanted to just look at, you know, the upper reaches of that river, the middle reaches of that river, the lower reach, and, and here's a very rudimentary map to show us what the upper, the middle, and the lower reach actually looks like, um, you know, we, we can look at just that. Here's the narrative in the upper reach various tributaries going into that reach, et cetera, middle, lower. And you know, we can look at how things have changed from the habitat sample, the area, the percent riffle, the percent run, and that's good and everything, but that really doesn't tell us a story unless you actually start comparing, you know, data versus versus something else. So we're looking at clay substrate in the upper, middle, and lower reach. Let's compare that to, you know, the run then. You know, here's the clay in the upper, middle, and lower. Let's compare that to the percent run, the percent pool, the backwater, you know, the percent silt. And as you can see, this is pretty rudimentary. It did the job for the university, but 
four or five years ago, you know, this is kind of where we started with data. This is not real time. This is data, you know, collected from, uh, you know, it's a database. Whereas the others that I showed you, the Walker Basin as well as Lake Houston, those are being pulled in real time from the National Water Information System of the USGS. And we're able to pull that uh, every two minutes. Um, particular stream gauges, for example, if we wanted to, we can pull that every 30 seconds, depending upon the situation, depending upon what the well, geographically, geographically where it is, or you know, is it in a, a high a danger zone, if you will. So, uh, but just to keep going here, you know, just to look at things comparatively to one another, this has everything to do with just that river, the upper, middle, and the lower. And I just wanted to, just to give you guys a, a little show of, you know, yes, this worked great, and now we can do this so much better, right? There's so many more tools out there, so many more skill sets out there, um, and just things are changing rapidly. And Sharon, you were at ESIS, so you probably saw a lot of that rapid change, but, but, uh, but yeah. Um, don't know if you wanted me to show you any more than that. Didn't want to inundate you, but but that's kind of where we're at in terms of real time. So I wanted to show the real time aspect of things. Thank you for all of that, Sachin. All right, any questions? I can start off with a question. I have a question about Walker Basin. So you said that you aggregated a lot of data sets, and looks like that would be great for identifying gaps or maybe redundant monitoring locations. Have you used it? For that to discover gaps. Yep, they 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 <laughs> certainly have. Um, a lot of the gaps that they recognized are gaps in between, like reaches, for example. Why isn't there mm -hmm. a particular Why isn't there a particular stream gauge here? Well, the answer could be, well, it's it's not well suited for a stream gauge. But at least those questions are being asked. So, you know, why isn't there a stream gauge here? Do we need another snow tail site here? Do we need more sort of, do we even need groundwater wells on the site? Is there any kind of groundwater surface water interaction going on? You know, right. what I've noticed is maybe the solution may even be, well, we just don't have the funds, number one, whoever that is, whatever partner. But number two, um, it might not be the right place to have one. Number three, maybe they want to prioritize something else. But those questions are being asked, which is great. And they're being asked on a more frequent basis. That's kind of what I'm looking at metric is are those questions being asked in the first place, how frequent, and they're just getting better and better. And so that's that's what I see. Right. A lot of what people are addressing at ESIP is um, how can we aggregate databases and have similar metrics or similar indicators enough so that the data would be interoperable or reusable? I mean, maybe maybe. Uh, I don't know, a university or private environmental consulting firm puts a couple of monitoring locations up, but the way they're collecting the data isn't, wouldn't be compatible with, with data that you're collecting. So that's a concern too. So anyone else have questions about um, how this comes about? Um, I think the real-time feeds are especially interesting. Um, or any questions about what Sachin and Steve are doing? Hi, this is I actually have a, I have a question. Oh. Can you talk a little bit about your technology stack for this visualization here? Yeah. So for the real time, what we did is, you know, this is this is Leaflet, which is what we based this on. And mm -hmm. we're pulling, we have a redundant sort of system where we're pulling data out of NWIS, uh, putting it on that particular server, and we're serving, I think, five to seven days worth of information. So Leaflet is what we're using the platform for. And I'll just go one step beyond that is that, most of the real time or pretty much all the real time things that people ask us to do, we're able to use that same framework. And what's nice is that means that we don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over. But but let me get a more robust answer for you with more specifics and I can email that with our developer if you need more more than that for sure. That'd be great. This is Jen. I I do have some questions about how you're serving this in USGS, but maybe it'd be better offline because it's more of a USGS question. Because we have built uh, monitoringresources.org outside of USGS. It's not a .gov. It's a .org for PNAP use. Yep. And um, we're in the process of moving some components of it to Leaflet. 
so this has been a really cool thing to see, and uh, I'd love to talk to you offline um, about how you got this going, and <laughs> probably have some more questions about Leaflet. So I'll, sure thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and Becca Scully is working with with us on that on monitoringresource.org. She might be great if we could set up a time to pick your brain a little bit since we're new to Leaflet. So sure, I'd be happy to. This is Russell Scran. Uh, thank you for the presentation and. Uh, with the presentation and the summaries, the links uh, will be provided. We can access these and navigate to them, for example. So I think the water summaries and the uh, things that we're looking at here, uh, there have been ongoing conversations with water quality leads at BPA and, and things like that. How do we look at these river networks? How do we look at flow networks? How do we look at things when we're doing water transactions and purchasing water rights? I think these are very, very good examples of what we can share at BPA for our water transaction program for you know, helping to identify um, or look at data to help us identify and prioritize where we would want to potentially acquire in-stream rights. And um, as data visualizations, we use Leaflet and other things as well. Um, but I just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and uh, again, hopefully the, the links will be available and are summarized for us. Thank you. All right. So more questions, more comments, more thoughts. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thanks, everybody, and especially thank you, Steve and Sachin.